Stuka champion, John Higgins. Hello, welcome to tonight's Snooker Live. The drive for the quarterfinals here at the Daffabet World Snooker Championship is up and running and alive and well. We've got some seriously intriguing matches. One, uh, just to bring you up to speed with from yesterday, was the very last of the first round matches to get finished. It was Neil Robertson closing in on a ton of tons. He's now up to 97 centuries. He finished off against debutante Robbie Williams, 10 frames to two. There was pretty much nothing Williams could have done about that. Robertson in sensational form and he is absolutely desperate to secure a second world title having done his first here in 2010. I'm joined by Jason Ferguson, chairman of the WPBSA. Jason, before we talk a little bit more about the, uh, the brilliant coaching setup that World Snooker have uh, initiated going into schools, let's just spend a moment or two talking about what an amazing achievement that would be for Neil Robertson if he was able to produce a hundred centuries in a single season. And let's face it, the form he's in at the moment and the fact that he's got Mark Allen next, he's got a great chance of doing it. Yes, absolutely, Rob. Um, what an incredible achievement to even be thinking about a hundred centuries in one season. You know, it doesn't seem that long ago we used to think about career centuries and we would talk about, you know, this, this man could, could hit a hundred centuries in a career. Um, but to think that in one season, uh, you know, Neil could actually make 100 centuries. It's just incredible. And just it's just testament to the standard of snooker that's being played right now. Yeah, because I think Ding is in second place. And, and we all know what a great season Ding's had, despite the fact he's been knocked out in the first round here. But, but over the course of his five ranking event titles, to, to tie that record with Stephen Hendry, he's, he's the second best. But, but he's at least, what, 20, 30 centuries behind. It, it's, it's an amazing tally from Robbo. It is. And, and, you know, Neil's been world number one, of course. And there's a reason for that and, and that is because he's the best player in the world at that time and you know th this type of heavy scoring is hard to hard to battle against and, and that's really what's kept him at the top um, but it's, we've seen the form this week from him um, tremendously consistent and I, 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 to be honest with you I am expecting him to break that that record this week. Well and maybe it will come in that match uh, against Mark Allen which we're all very much looking forward to. Another match which is turning out to be a really really fascinating encounter is the one between Joe Perry and Ronnie O'Sullivan and, and I think people sometimes almost have one hand you know giving the trophy to uh, to Ronnie but uh, it was a brilliant second session they resumed 5-3 with Joe Perry leading they shared the frame so 9-7 and uh, it will come to a dramatic conclusion tomorrow all credit to Joe Perry though for proving why he's back in the world's top 16 not intimidated by opponent or occasion and that is all set for a fantastic climax tomorrow Yes, absolutely, Rob. The one thing about Joe Perry is he has a fantastic all-round game. He, he knows how to control the table. He knows how to keep his opponent out. Safety play is impeccable. Um, his long game has been very good as well. And he can score when it counts. I mean, he, he is the complete package. And, and he's, it's going to be tough for Ronnie this. And Ronnie's you know, undoubtedly the greatest talent we've ever seen in the game. And a lot of people would have said pre this match, you know, of course, Ronnie's a big favourite and he's going to win. But you just can't underestimate anybody at the moment. And particularly the way the snooker is going and the season is getting longer. These players are playing more and more. And we're seeing it in some of the, I'll call them the old timers, and I'm sure they'll thank me for that. But, you know, Alan McManus, Ken Doherty, they say they're old timers. But actually they're back in form. They're playing sharp snooker. They're sharp because they're playing all year round. And this is what's difficult for Ronnie right now. Joe Perry is sharp, he's match fit, and he's very dangerous. Well, and as you said, just before we went live, so much can change overnight. And, and that could be the case for Ronnie or it could be the case for Joe. We're certainly in for a, a great climax. Just before that, we talk about the, the coaching initiative. You mentioned about the old timers. Alan McManus, I think at the last uh, time we checked, was 4-2 up against uh, Ken Doherty. Remember, they're the two oldest guys in the draw. McManus, 43. Ken Doherty, 44. It's the third time they've met in the last 16. The first of those was a 13-11 to Doherty back in 1994. The second was also 13-11 to McManus. So that one's got an awful lot of snooker left to be played. And, uh, and I know the crowd are very much enjoying that one, along with the, uh, the, the, the novelty tartan trues that Alan McManus is certainly wearing to good effect at the moment. So that's, uh, that's your update on the match that's, uh, that's in progress right now. And of course, there are two others uh, to come at seven o'clock. We'll talk about those in due course. Let's touch then on this brilliant coaching initiative to, to take snooker into schools. It seems as though, from the reaction you've had so far, that it's going really well. 
Yeah, we're delighted to be quite honest. We, we launched a programme here last year to really get 10,000 people uh, in school involved in snooker and, and I have to say the, proje the project has just grown and grown and grown. Kids uh, all ages, uh, both uh, girls, boys, you know, snooker is a very accessible sport and that's one of the big messages that we're putting across here. Functional snooker is a game which we've developed to go into the schools as part of the education program. What that's doing is actually teaching young children maths and English and having fun at the same time. The, the idea really was, was born out of um, Chris Lovell, who's our head of coaching and development, uh, myself and Steve Davis, obviously six times world champion. We, we, we brainstormed the idea. Chris Lovell has really been the brains to, to deliver the programme and, it, and it's been a tremendous, uh, tremendous scheme all around. It's received great reports from Ofsted even. They, they've even said that um, you know, it's, it's outstanding. Um, it's out so, th you know, this is, this, is, this is a big, big opportunity for snooker to actually develop further. Thousands and thousands of children now, not just in England, but around the world, are actually picking snooker cues up in school and having lessons on that snooker table. So, um, it's a good time ahead. It's quite clever as well because some people still have a somewhat outdated view, parents especially, that snooker clubs are a little bit seedy. So where we might be missing out on, on the next generation of players with parents reluctant to take them down to their local club, even though the club would, would obviously accommodate them brilliantly, there's no problem when snooker comes in to the school. It's, it's all inclusive and it takes away any preconceived ideas the parents may have about going down a local club. Absolutely, and you know, long gone are the days of the, the old smoky halls and, and the downtrodden image that snooker once carried. You know, snooker is, it, it, the clubs themselves are actually being built in the schools. So what, what we're actually doing is putting small snooker tables in the schools. They're, they're folding tables, they can be put away. We can turn a sports hall into a snooker club in around 10 minutes time. It's very simple to do that. And Let's, let's face it, the weather's not always great in England as well. I, I spoke to one of the schools here this week and he said, you know, oh, we're so happy that snooker's here, that, you know, that we can actually play snooker in our games lesson. It's been raining all week. You know, this is, this, is, this is the answer to actually getting kids involved in other sports. What we want as a sport is we want snooker to take its place amongst the world's sports and gain that respect as a world sport. And actually that is a battle we're winning. And part of that battle is again to introduce it to young children. So very pleased with the project. There's a, there's a, a whole world ahead of us, I'll, I'll be honest. We, we're only scratching the surface right now, but the results have been incredible. We've seen incredible results in, in, in maths with young children. We know that the, 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 there are government initiatives now that want to um, really improve the, the, the basic maths and English and particularly with arithmetic and, and again the idea was it came out of the fact that every snooker player you talk to he's a great mathematician he, he can do uh, basic arithmetic in his head within a second three reds left on the table how many I can tell you it's 51 Rob you know it's three red three blacks and all the colors any snooker player can look at a snooker table and instantly work out the value on the, on the table and that's really what we've turned into a maths lesson well, long may the, uh, may the great work continue from Chris Lovell, from yourself and from uh, Steve Davis. Uh, I'm sure it's going to enjoy continued success. So thanks for now, Jason. Uh, one of the great things about working here at the Crucible is that you never know when you might bump into uh, to a former champion. And one man who's always very much hard at work for the BBC, either in the commentary box, doing the whole touch screen analysis, or just sitting in the studio uh, watching the action and answering the questions, is John Parrott. And we managed to grab 15 minutes or so with him after he'd had his breakfast this morning to talk about snooker, life, and of course the other love of his life, apart from snooker and his family, Everton. Well, who better to do a newspaper review with than with the 1991 champion of the world? He is always good for a chinwag. In fact, we haven't probably got enough time, but uh, <laughs> good morning, John. Good morning. Now then, uh, we've just got an array of papers. Let's start off. The, uh, the Sun are running a story, Shoe Beauty, Dominic Earns' His Stripes. It's uh, quite funny. It's referring to these outrageous shoes that, that Dominic wore yesterday uh, in his victory against Mark Davis, eventually getting across the line. He is such a character, Dominic, isn't he? Well, he brings great colour to it. I mean, we all we all give him a bit of stick. We call him the space man. He's different. I mean, he was blonde last week before he turned up. Now he was brunette, so they had to redo all the shooting of his of his stuff again because he changed the colour of his hair. And I mean, you never know what you're going to get with him. He has the purple backs on his waistcoat, and as I say, he's eccentric and a little odd at times. But 
He certainly adds a bit of colour to the circuit. I was just saying to you before we uh, went in to record that yesterday at the press conference he was talking about a frame which went to Mark Davis and he said he left the Reds, he said it was like an orchard of Reds waiting for Davis to pick them off. Have you ever heard that expression before? No, it's actually very good, it's quite intelligent but no, not heard it before. But those shoes, he came, into the, he came in after he'd won yesterday and he came and sat down and showed us what they were but I don't know how you, how you polish those because you've got black bits, white bits, <laughs> I mean, what, what, do you put, what do you put on those to keep them clean? But Anyway, they, they, they certainly make him stand out. Uh, and what a great match that's going to be between him and Michael Wosley. And it will be interesting, actually, to see how Dominic copes with the fact that as he's a, you know, a double-ranking event winner, even though Wosley's beaten Ding, Dominic probably starts that one as favourite, and that's a very different type of pressure for him. Well, it's also a different type of pressure for Michael Wosley because Michael Wosley's had a result now. He's beaten Ding's young way. There's a lot more expectation on him, I think, as well, because he's had a you know he's had a massive result. People know who he is, and he's in the second round of the World Championship with the biggest match he's ever played. So, believe you me, that's an interesting encounter because it's on both players there. Uh, the times have gone with the story. Robertson moves closer to the century of centuries. He's now uh, very, very close to getting uh, to getting the ton ton. I mean, just put that into context uh, as to what sort of achievement that would be if, if he is. And, and it looks as though he will do, judging by the number of centuries he's knocked off already and the class he showed in that first round match against Robbie Williams. What sort of achievement would that be? Well, it's phenomenal. And, and, and there's a very good chance it may never be beaten. I mean, that is a seriously unbelievable milestone he's going to pass. And I think he'll pass it next match. I mean, he's got a best of 25 coming up. Every time he's in the balls, he looks like he's going to make 100. I think that could go next match. And, and how exciting would it be? There's a long, long way to go, of course. But Robertson just looks as though he's arrived here. He's very laid back off the table, but he's, he's full of fire on it. And he, he I suspect, would love a head-to-head -head with, uh, with O'Sullivan in the final. Well, he would do if, if O'Sullivan's going to get there. I mean, there's a lot of snooker to be played here so far. I mean, we know he's 5-3 down after the first session, Ronnie, so he's got a bit of work to do. He looks like a competitive animal again. He, was, he wasn't particularly well health-wise, was he, when he got beaten in China by Ding? He's had time to recover, come back. I think he's due a massive performance in this, and the way he's played first round has been as good as anybody. Well, he's got Mark Allen as well, so that, that, that could be a fantastic match to watch. Hopefully Mark Allen's improved health-wise because he's been sick. He was sick for two or three days. He never said anything about it, but he was pretty bad. And I think he just played hard snooker against Michael Holt, who didn't do himself justice, really. But he just played to get 10 Mark Allen. So hopefully he's recovered because two attacking players like that should give us a good match. Now, one match which we are so looking forward to is your mate, Ken Doherty, oh. rolling back the years with Alan McManus. Unbelievable. What a brilliant story. It's a shame one of them's got to lose, but we are guaranteed a McManus or a Doherty in the quarterfinals. That is a brilliant story. Yeah, 87 years between them combined, <laughs> which is unbelievable. 44 and 43. Listen, they've been two of the finest match players. I've played in the, very, in the same era as them. And if you've got Angles McManus or you've got Ken Doherty in the draw, you had a serious tough test ahead of you because they don't play the wrong shots. They play the correct shots all the time and both to a very high standard. That'll be seriously tough. I mean, it, it, it'll be great to watch. As I said, I mentioned it's one for the purists. If you really like your good match play snooker, those two are two of the best protagonists, but it could be a grueler. But what will be great about watching that, it may be a little similar to when the Angles played John Higgins. There was a little bit of banter as they sat in the chair, and even though the match didn't yeah. go the way John was expecting, it was played in such a great spirit, and there will be moments of banter between the two of them. Yeah, the funny thing about the higgins matt Manus game is the two of them were sitting in the club next to each other looking up at the screen when the draw came out. So as each name was coming out, and Alan was going, I haven't come out yet, you know, John. I, my name's still in there. And as he was going, and all of a sudden he went, John Higgins will play, and he went, here we go, and he went, Alan matt Manus. <laughs> We were due to have a practice session, best of 19 the next day, which they looked at each other and immediately cancelled. So that was one of the one of the funny things about that draw. Um, yeah, I mean, McManus versus Doherty will be an it'll be it'll be great to watch. I'll be fascinating to watch, and when the two of them play, it'll be lots of clever stuff in it. Now let's just talk briefly about Barry Hearn's shake-up. There's never a dull moment when yeah. Hearn comes up to the Crucible, and he's inviting all former world champions to take their place in the qualifiers for the World Championship next year. Is that something which interests you or will we be seeing you in the box and on the studio only? In the box and on the studio and if there's a golf course open when the World Championships is being played, and I'm sure there will be, I'll be on the golf course. <laughs> Listen, I've had my time, Rob. I've played, enjoyed it and I retired because I'd got fed up no, not producing the standard I wanted to play. Uh, it's a wonderful invitation to people. I, don't, I, I, and I found out I wouldn't be taking anyone's place if I've played anyway, but I, I, it's a time for somebody else to play.
Yeah, that's, and that's very generous of you to, uh, to, to have that attitude. Let's quickly talk about, uh, talk about Everton. It's really tight between you and Arsenal. Now, you've got Southampton tomorrow, then Man City and Hull. What do you make of that run-in? Well, all three of them are tricky in their own way. Um, it's difficult to go down there to St Mary's and get a result. Southampton have been a good team this year. Pass the ball well, play a similar style to us, so it always makes it difficult. That'll be a hard game with no Morales as well for the last three games with a groin strain. The City game speaks for itself. If they're still involved with it, I mean, they're still a powerhouse, aren't they, in the sport? So that'll be a tough game at home. And we'll have no Gareth Barry because he'll be, obviously, he, against the loan system, he can't play against City. And then the final one is Hull. Now, looking at it first, you think, oh, that's handy, because if Hull are safe, they're in the cup final. But Jelovic and Longer cup tied, so they're bound to play against us as well. So, you know, the, the, all three of them have got something in there that's a bit tricky. Did you have, on a sort of personal level, did you have uh, any sympathy? Do you think the Everton fans felt sorry for, for David Moyes in, in the manner in which his departure came about because he helped contribute to some wonderful, wonderful years at Everton and, and he seems, from a, from a non-expert's perspective, to be a guy of real honest endeavour and integrity. Well, I think he was in the training first every day and the last to leave every day. I mean, I shook his hand when he left at the awards and wished him all the best and genuinely did because, you know, I thought our club was in safe hands when he was a manager of it. Never thought we were ever in any trouble. We were always well prepared. We always gave, we had a lot of great nights there. It's just moved on. I mean, he's gone to another job and you couldn't knock him for taking the Manchester United job. For what we're seeing from our own point of view, it's been like a breath of fresh air. I have to be honest with you, it's a better style of football that we watch now. Certainly more pleasing on the eye. That's just certain managers get results certain ways, don't they? And Roberto gets the ball down and passes it. And to be honest with you, I've gone home and away most of the year this year with my son. And it's been fabulous to watch. That really has been fabulous. And no matter where we finish in the league, we'll have had a great season. And we'll have had a season with a, with a, a very upwardly mobile manager who's extremely positive. And uh, again, well, we could talk to you for hours. Before we get to your tip, just, to, just another question with regards to football. I don't know, there's such a fierce rivalry between Everton and Liverpool. From a neutral's perspective, it, it, it almost seems as though it would be fitting with, with the context of Hillsborough for, for Liverpool to take the title this year. We saw the solidarity in the city with, the, with that very moving anniversary. And I know the Everton supporters were, were, were basically very gracious about that. The city really came together. Will there be some warmth from Everton towards Liverpool if they do take the title, bearing in mind the context of the year? Or, or not really, because the rivalry is so fierce? It depends on what your, what your viewpoint is, isn't it, really? I mean, what they were saying the other week is most of the Liverpool fans are saying, we want Everton to get fourth. It would be great if we can win the league. And Everton fans are saying, well, we don't mind Liverpool winning it if we get fourth. But that looks like it's going to go right down to the wire on that one. So it's tricky to say. But listen, there's lots of there's lots of bitter blues in the city. You don't want Liverpool to win it. Just as there's a few of them who are not that too bothered. It's just it's just what your own opinion is. Listen, what, from my own viewpoint, I'm I'm probably with Steven Gerrard. I live not far from him, and I see him a couple of mornings a week. And um, you know, we always have a chat. And uh, for him, for the career that he's had, to have been a good the, the player that he's been for so long, I think for him personally, it'd be great if he could. Not go out because I think he's got a couple of seasons left. But to win the championship for his efforts for that club would probably be. Uh, I'd be happy with that. Okay, we could go on for hours, but we've got to matches to get underway at ten o'clock. Just finally, you're you're a massive expert on the racing. I know you've uh, you've been to Chester recently, and you'll be there again soon for a big celebration. Any tips for us today? What have you got? Well, I've scoured through the card quickly for you. There's got to be one horse, Rob. It's tonight, seven twenty-five. It's Tony McCoy, and it's called Chalk It Down. Warren Greatex is in great form. He's been banging winners in all over the place. This one again uh, last week or so. And it, it's run it, chalk it down. It got to be AP McCoy, 7.25. Right, that's the bet to put on today. John, thanks very much for your time. I know you, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty exhausting schedule for you with the, with the TV commitments for the BBC. So thanks very much. Pleasure. And uh, good luck for Everton's running. Yeah. So chalk it down is John Parrott's top tip. You still have mm, around about 45 minutes as we're doing this live to go and get that bet on. Uh, and who knows, John certainly knows a thing or two about, uh, about snooker and horse racing. So uh, get a fiver on and, uh, and see how you go. So we're wrapping up uh, tonight's snooker live because we've got live action on the arena floor. We have the second instalment of Barry Hawkins against Ricky Walden. Barry was 3-0 up right at the beginning of that match, but Ricky's come back to 4-all. Remember, it's a rerun of their semi-final from last year and tonight we also know that we'll find out the identity of the first player 
to qualify for this year's quarterfinals. Mark Selby is 9-7 up against Ali Carter. That one coming to a dramatic conclusion. They're on stage at the Crucible, just gone 7 o'clock. So we better hop foot it out there and warm up the crowd. Thanks for your company this evening, this afternoon and this morning. It's been a fantastic day of action here at the Crucible. And guess what? We get to do it all over again tomorrow and for another nine days after that. Thanks for your company. See you tomorrow. Enjoy the live action tonight when it gets underway at 7 o'clock on the BBC. Bye-bye.